I want to cry, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to go with you and tell you my story. You have a story, I have a story, but I don't live my story. I have a story, but I'm not my story. Improve your digestion fast by using mass zymes from Bioptimizers. Click the link in the description or pinned comment to save 10%. Edie, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. Happy to talk to you. I'm really looking forward to this. And I want to start all the way back as, as you, as a kid, were a really proficient gymnast. And you would yes. have actually made the Olympics if you weren't Jewish. They cut you from the team because of your your religion and your background. So talk about how old you were at that time and, and how you felt when that happened. I was uh, between 14 and 15, and that was probably the most biggest shock of my life. And I, I just cannot tell you the pain that my teacher had telling me that I don't qualify and I have to train someone else who is not Jewish. So this was hitting me and, uh, and I began to just grieve over where I am. Now I'm watching the Olympics and uh, thinking of Simone, how that she decided uh, to step out because I'm sure that she was not able to even remember her routine very well. Um, the mind gets overwhelmed. I don't know, I wish I could talk to her, but I think she made the right decision because she's not quitting at all. Uh, she's going to prepare for uh, not winning the battle, but to win the war. The long-term hedonism is better than the short-term. So when this happened to you all the way back when you were a teen, had you seen a lot of discrimination because you were Jewish yes. at that time? Uh, you already had yes, at that point. I, was, I went to a Jewish school, and when we came out, children were spitting at me, and they called me a Christ killer. I didn't know that Jesus was a poor little Jewish boy. I didn't know any of that. And uh, yes, uh, yes, kids were spitting and calling me, unfortunately, a Christ killer. And I had no idea. I had no idea that Jesus was a Jew. So now we are here, and what do you think I tell you what happened January 6th? In January 6th, I saw someone wearing a shirt that six million was not enough. And history has a tendency to repeat itself. It's very important for us to learn from history because George Santayana uh, told us that history has a tendency to repeat itself. So we can talk about the past and hopefully do everything in our power that it's not going to happen to anyone ever again. That's my goal. That's what I do. I'm hoping that people look at me as a guide and find the Hitler in themselves and find the, the good things and the love that we are born with and the passion and also joy in life. That's what we're born with. We're born with joy. We're born happy. 
and then we learn to hate. We are taught to hate. You, you were probably, maybe your parents were not really prejudiced, but um, when I came to America in 1949 and I went to the bathroom, one of them said, colored. After Nazi Germany <laughs> and communist uh, people and taking over and and I come to America looking for, <laughs> okay, looking for democracy. And I'm hoping that we can empower each other with our differences. That you can be you and I can be I. When I go to Ireland, I know the Catholics and the Protestants. And, you know, it's the us and them mentality. It's still there. But I like to believe and be for something rather than against something. I want to be for life. I want to be for empowering each other. So you can be you and I can be I, but together we're going to be much, much stronger. And that's what Auschwitz was, an opportunity for each of us to learn and form a family of inmates. All we had was each other then, and all we have is each other now. By the way, I like your shirt. Thank you. I don't know who bought it for you. I like it a lot. Thank you so much. And I like your scarf. We're both done up very nice for the occasion. My father told me that when I grow up, I'll be the best dressed girl in town. And so... I want to say, Papa, yes, I like to hopefully be as elegant as I can and, and a good role model also for young people that they are truly loving themselves enough that they get up in the morning and recognize that life is just one day, that morning sunshine doesn't come back. So how to enjoy every moment. So I'm at the evening part of my life. I was very, very well, beautifully celebrated last Saturday. And uh, I am 93 now, and I'm going to be 94. And I think young. And I live in the present. I can only touch you now. I think that's important for you to think about your thinking. That makes a lot of sense. And we're going to get to being in Auschwitz. You mentioned Auschwitz. We're going to get to how being in the present moment and, you know, being in your own head in a state of peace during a time of such turmoil really saved you during that horrific time. But I want to build up to that. I want to talk about the story of, of, you know, being taken from your home and getting to Auschwitz because you have such an incredible, inspiring story that I want to make sure we go through. So let's go back to, we talked about being in your teens and, and being a gymnast and how proficient you were at that. How much later on in the story is it when you're taken from your home along with your sister and your parents, and loaded into a cattle car to head to Auschwitz. I'm going to take you to 1944, when the Germans took over Hungary. And I, I remember having a Passover dinner, and my father got up and kissed us over our heads and went to sleep. And a few hours later, banging on the door, and they picked us up and took us in Kasha, Hungary, to a factory. And uh, from there to the cattle car. 
And as I was put in the cattle car, my boyfriend told me, I will never forget your eyes, and I never forget your hands. You have beautiful eyes, and you know what that kept me alive in Auschwitz. I would go to everyone, tell me about my eyes, tell me about, tell me about, tell me about. And when we were completely naked, and my sister looked at me and asked me, how do I look? That's really a typical Hungarian woman's question. How do I look? It's very important to really look well. And I had a choice then, as you have a choice now. And I could have told Magda how she really looked, completely naked, totally bored. But just like I'm talking in the book and the, in the gift, I said to Magda, you know, honey, you have such beautiful eyes. And I didn't see it when you had your hair all over the place. So you see, I always tell people before you say something, ask yourself whether it is really important, whether it is really necessary. But most of all, is it kind? When you had this conversation with your sister, was this when you guys had gotten to the camp? You mentioned shaved heads, so I'm assuming it was after you were in the camp and and you had had all your possessions taken away and and you and your sister were were shaved and, and such. Well, what happened in a cattle car that I always say when I go to schools, that my mother told me, uh, we don't know where we're going. We don't know what's going to happen. Just remember, no one can take away from you what you put here in your own mind. So I beg young people not to smoke pot and not to mess with their brains. So I'm a little bit preachy, uh, not too much, but I am asking young people to not to have the biochemical means to happiness. Your your brain is fine. Just use it. And uh, I uh, I'm very very much loving the young people because they are the future. You are the future. You are the ambassadors for peace and goodwill. So I hand you the torch and letting you know that life is beautiful and you can empower each other with your wonderful, kind, loving, authentic, one-of-a-kind you. There never ever be another you. Your unique, one-of-a-kind diamond. I like that, and so true. And when your mother's You're precious. and when your mother shared those wise words with you on the train car, how did they impact you at the time? Your mom's words carried me and is carrying me today because she was wise, not smart, and I'm hoping to be wise too, not smart to think before I say something, and to guide people to be their own good parent. Are you a good parent to you? Because there is a little boy in you maybe crying, and that little boy tells you, I need a healthy parent, and you're going to show up for him. Do you have children? Yes, one young girl who's a year and a half, and we have another child coming at the end of this year. Oh, wow. Well, you see, you are the role model to the children the way you treat their mother. Because children don't do what we say. They do what they see. I hope you never raise your voice, ever. There's healthier ways of... Children, startle. Startle. 
get scared. So the best thing for your children is a happy marriage, and I'm sure that's what you're practicing. Definitely. And if not, just think of me, because I, I hope to give you some ways to truly be the best, wonderful, loving parents to you. Well, I appreciate that. You have a lot of wisdom that we're going to get into and you're already sharing, which is which is great. Coming back to the story, when you are getting onto this cattle car, where do you think you guys are headed at that time? I had no idea. We were told we're going to Hungary to work on the fields. And that didn't happen until I saw the sign, Arbeit macht frei, work make you free. And my father said to us, it's okay, we're just going to work and then go home. That didn't happen at all. We were separated. And my parents, unfortunately, ended up in a gas chamber. And my sister and I, Magda, had each other to take care of. If you ask my sister, she'll tell you that she took care of me. And if you ask me, I will tell you that I took care of my sister. So who are you going to believe? I think we had each other to take care of. And I usually give her the bread that I saved from the night before. We got a little soup with some medication on it. And so I ate the soup and I and I saved the bread because my sister was heavier and she suffered more from hunger than I did. So it was important for us to take care of each other and form a family of inmates, very important, that we had each other. And I knew exactly who was going to die. I could see it. I could study their eyes. I could study the way they begin to withdraw. And uh, I became a very good observer. Even today, I'm a pretty good observer. Who is going to want to hold on to the victim's mentality and who is willing to let go. And that's my definition of of love, the ability to let go. Well, when you talk about being able to look into somebody's eyes in the concentration camp and still be able to have that skill to to know when somebody's going to pass, what is it you're seeing in their eyes that you're able to determine that? I see apathy. Hopelessness. Helplessness. And even worthlessness. And I kept telling myself, I don't like it, it's inconvenient, and it's temporary, and I can survive it. Unless they threw me in a gas chamber at 4 o'clock in the morning, we had to stand outside. I said to myself, I'm going to do exactly what I'm told to do. I'm not going to ever uh, fight with anyone. I'm just going to do what at night. I had my dream. I was dancing. I was dancing. I was dancing at the Budapest Opera House. And uh, the night was mine. And thank God, thank God, what happened was that we never knew what's going to happen next. I think what helped me to survive is curiosity. I always wanted to know what's going to happen next. And that's why COVID is so difficult, because we don't know. See, when we took a shower in Auschwitz, we didn't know whether water or gas is going to come out. It's very hard to be in a limbo. I think that's very, very important to acknowledge. 
in COVID that we don't know. Well, take us back to being in the camp and and how you were able to go about moving forward when there was so much uncertainty and your life was at stake. I think we can take a lot from from the resilience you showed in the camp and apply it to, you know, COVID, you mentioned COVID or other uncertainty in life because all of us as humans face so much of it no matter what. There is no guarantee. There is no guarantee. There is not even certainty, but there is probability. There is probability that if you live in a present, do everything in your power, that if you survive today, then tomorrow, tomorrow became my friend, for sure, that tomorrow I'll be free. I'm going to see my boyfriend. Uh, he's going to see my eyes and my hands and the hope and the hope and the, and, and the good ending um, was created constantly in my own mind rather than giving up. There was a girl with me that's important from Yugoslavia, and she told me that we're going to be liberated by Christmas, and Christmas came. We were not liberated, and she died the next day. So it's 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 really good to be more flexible, and and uh, not to have all or nothing thinking. And some people fluctuate from being helpless to total grandiosity. That's not good either. Nothing is good what you do in excess. So it's good to have a, a good, good, good balance between working, loving, and playing. Do you play enough? I do. And I think a big part of that is the fact that I have a young daughter because I, I do love the work I do and I can get pulled into that. But because I have a young daughter and now that I'm a, a newer dad, I'm getting to relive my childhood in a way through her. And we play every day and, and, and it's it's a constant reminder of the importance of play and, and it's it's so much fun. So it pulls me in. Very important. I hope you go dancing with your wife once a week, hopefully that you have a date and uh, and you go and dance and kiss her tummy. So when is the next child coming? The end of December of this year. So we're actually at the halfway point today. And it's going to be? We actually just found out today it's going to be a boy. So we're going to have one of each. Ah, you're going to have one of each. You're very, very lucky. I feel it. I feel after, very lucky. After, after two girls, I had a boy. Um, my son John was born. And uh, so I'm happy for you to have one of each. And, and maybe you're just going to be the happiest parents how the children can love each other and teach each other and play together and uh, also having good grandparents. My children never had any grandparents. And that's why I moved here to La Jolla, in California. And then, then, then my children left and they went to New York. So I tell parents, don't follow your children because they move. You better have a life of your own and not to hold on to your children's children's coat. So where do you live? In Ontario, Canada. In, uh, yeah, I love Canada. I love Canada. There are many, many good people in Canada, many, many, many immigrants who were not able to come to America, and thank God they were able to go to Canada. I spoke at the uh, Young President's Organization 
agree there. What the YPO, I don't know if you know those people. They do a lot of good work all over the world. They have the money and they spend it educating children, building homes, really good people who put their money to good use. I very much, very much appreciate the YPO. I hope you find them and give them my love. Well, I want to come back to your story here. And you mentioned earlier the fact that your parents ended up dying in the concentration camp. And I know that happened basically upon arrival. So let's let's talk about the the situation, getting off the cattle car. You're with your family. I'd love for you to take us through what that experience was like. So we 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 stood in line. Okay, men and women separated. I hold my mother, my sister Magda holds my mother, and she's in the middle. And there is a guy in a white uniform. And I am wearing a lovely silk dress with two bows. And I see him watching my my bows and then asking me, is this your mother or is this your sister? Pointing at my mother. And I could never forgive myself by saying it's my mother. So she took my mother we call it the finger game, life or death. So I actually followed my mother and the very man who annihilated my family grabbed me and said, you're going to see your mother very soon. She's just going to take a shower and promptly threw me on the other side which meant life. And I was met with a capo. A capo was also an inmate who came there earlier. The Polish people came first. The Hungarian people came last. So I was part of the final solution when 15 highly educated people celebrated that they can put 30,000 Jews in the oven without even gassing them. That became the final solution of Eichmann, and I'm part of that final solution of Eichmann. So as, as she met me and took my earrings and grabbed me, and I was bleeding, and I said, I, I would have given it to you. And by the way, when will I see my mother? She pointed at the chimney, fire coming out, and telling me, your mother is burning there. You better talk about her in past tense. I never forget those words. And my sister hugged me and said, the spirit never dies. So what I'm working today, I'm always thinking that my mother spirit never dies, and I owe it to my mother to let people know what happens when good people do very bad things. So I'm hoping to talk to you and anyone who asks me about history because history does have a tendency to repeat itself. Well, I really appreciate you sharing. So thank you for you interviewing me while I'm st- still here, alive and well, and still dancing and celebrating every moment 
we don't seem to appreciate many times what we have until we lose it. And uh, that's why I eat everything on my plate. And if you don't eat yours, I'll eat yours or I'll take it home. I don't want to waste a piece of bread, ever. Food is important, very important in my day to have a good breakfast. And and I was cooking chicken paprikash, and I have leftovers, and that's what I'm going to have for lunch. And I have a patient who wants to eat with me, and that's what's going to happen. Uh, I love to cook Hungarian food, and I hope you like to eat them. Well, I'm not sure I've had a direct experience with Hungarian food, but from what I've read in the book and hearing you talk about it, it sounds incredible. Yes, go go and find a Hungarian immigrant who is hopefully cooking. So, Edie, I want to talk about there's a story you share in your your book, The Gift, and it really depicts your mental strength and how advanced and how much wisdom you had at such a young age. And this is towards the beginning of entering the camp when one of the officers tells you to dance for him. So yes. when did, when exactly Dr. did that Mangala. happen? Yes, let's talk about when that happened and, and how you were able to go inward. Oh, this guy came into the barracks and wanted to know who can entertain him. And the girls who knew me from uh, Hungary, because I used to dance when the president came, I had my Hungarian chardash, you know, I knew exactly the routine. So they just threw me in front of him. And he said, dance for me. And my teacher from the Jewish school, who happened to be there, gave me that finger, you know, that bony f parent finger, and said, you do as you're told. Don't even think about it, not to, not to do what you're asked to do. And I write about it because I closed my eyes and pretended that the music was Tchaikovsky. And I was dancing the Romeo and Juliet at the Budapest Opera House. I checked out. The first thing I did when I went back to Budapest, I went to the Hungarian wonderful theater. And I ended up actually seeing Boris Yakov dancing in the opera house in Sydney, Australia, where my sister was playing in the orchestra as a violinist. So I was fortunate enough to see the best, the best in dancing. Thank you. Oh, I want to cry, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to go with you and tell you my story. You have a story, I have a story, but I don't live my story. I have a story, but I'm not my story. I think that's important. I'm not a victim. It's not my identity. It's what was done to me. I refuse to be a victim. I was victimized. It's what was done to me. Never forget that. People say you overcame. I don't even know that word, what it means to overcome. But I came to terms with it, and I'm going to call it a cherished wound. Well, Edie, what I'm so curious about is, for somebody who was so young at the time, you're only a teen, how did you have that wisdom at that age to go inward? 
My mother told me, I'm glad that you have brains because you have no looks. So I was reading, reading and reading and reading, and uh, I became a very erudite, very learned uh, teenager. I think it's very important to go to the library instead of the bar <laughs> and uh, and uh, check out check out all the things that you can apply in your life that uh, it's okay to be a child person and you ask a child why do you do that and the child would say because I feel like it children don't care about consequences so as an adult I still feel like it because God gave us temptation but it doesn't mean I'm going to act upon it so I like the idea to be childlike but not childish. So that is very important for you that uh, you love your children, but the children are counting on you, protecting them, taking care of them, and even taking care of a dog or a puppy, whatever you have that the child can also learn from you and going from generation to generation. That is so important what we hand down and I'm hoping that I will be remembered that someone who didn't run away from the past to be able to revisit the places where you've been to relive that experience and then revise your life. That is the way I work because all therapy is grief work, not what happened, but what didn't happen. So when my granddaughter went to bishop school and asked me to buy her a pretty dancing dress, which I did, and I came home, and all of a sudden, I was crying. And I'm thinking, what am I crying about? I just bought Lindsay a beautiful dress. And I came to the realization that I'm not crying because I bought Lindsay a dress so she can go to her dance. I cried because I never went to a dance. And that's why it's important to really go back to the places where you've been and relive that experience, but not to get stuck in there. I think this is such an yes. important area that we go deeper into. Because I know part of your story was after the Holocaust, you kind of blocked that area of your life off for a period of time and didn't go back there. So I'd love for you to talk about what happened when you did that. And then over time, how you eventually decided to open up about it and how that changed everything. I was in therapy, actually, and I had a hard time with anger. So I asked my therapist to sit on me and not to let me get up. <laughs> Can you see me? You know, how to finally push that man away and deciding, uh, ah, I can do better than that. And, and I always say people don't come to me, they're sent to me. So I had two Vietnam veterans, and one of them was full of hate asking, why me? Conversely, the other one said to me, you know, Doc, I'm sitting in a wheelchair. I can see my children's eyes much closer, and I can see the flowers. And here I am wearing a coat, feeling terrible, because it's a Dr. Eager Department of Psychiatry. And I feel like a biggest phony ever. 
because I had a 16-year-old me that I ran away from. And I decided to go back to Auschwitz and go and look at the lion's place. And, and that was the most positive thing I did for me. But when I asked my sister to come with me to Auschwitz, she told me I'm an idiot. So we went through the same experience, entirely different responses. So I never asked my sister the next time, but I did go back to Auschwitz, finding the barrack where I danced for Dr. Mengele and how I dissociated and checked out and pretended that I'm at the Budapest Opera House dancing, the Romeo and Juliet. I think it's important not to run from the past, and I call it, that's why, the cherished wound. I cherished that part in me. That part of me was left in Auschwitz, but not the better part and not the bigger part. But I learned in Auschwitz how to even find love in hell. I want to talk more about going back to Auschwitz. I'm, I'm really interested in that. How long did you wait before going back? And talk about the feelings that came up. As you mentioned, you went right to the barracks where you danced. Talk about the feelings that came over you going back there. It was uh, 1944 when I danced in Auschwitz. When I went back, it was the Vietnam War going on the end of the 60s and the beginning of the 70s. So it's quite, quite, quite a difference. But when I came out, I saw someone with a uniform. And for a moment, I thought that I am the prisoner facing the Nazi. And the realization that I had a blue American passport in my pocket, that I'm not Popeye, that I am. And I, I tell you, that was a tremendous experience of liberation, that I was victimized. It's not who I am. It's what was done to me. And that's what forgiveness is. The revenge can give you a very big satisfaction. I, I, I grant you that, but it's very temporary because when you forgive, you free yourself and give yourself a gift. So uh, I am selfish. I don't have any godly powers, but if I would hate today, I would still be a prisoner. So I think it's very important, hopefully, because guilt has to do with the past, what you could have done and should have done, but you cannot change the past. You must tell yourself, if I knew then what I know now, I could have done things differently because my parents had tickets to come to America, but they didn't know that they didn't know, and they ended up dying in Auschwitz. So the past is guilt, and worry is future. What might happen and could happen and will happen and and you can scare your little girl, don't go there, you're going to fall down, don't go there, you're gonna, a dog is going to bite you. When you keep in fear and fear and fear, we're not born with fear. We learn to fear. We are taught to hate. I think it's very important before you say anything to anyone, whether it's really kind and most of all, is it necessary? And if not, that's why we have one mouth and two ears, so we can talk less and listen more. You talked about forgiveness there, 
And as somebody who's been through such horrific times in the concentration camp, at this point, do you totally forgive the Nazis for what you went through? I don't think it's up to me to forgive the Nazis. I think up to me to be human and knowing that uh, if I don't forgive, I'm still a prisoner. And that's why I ask people especially forgive themselves, because if they knew better, they would have done things very differently. To be really getting up in the morning and look in the mirror and say, I love me. And that's not narcissistic. Narcissistic people don't like themselves. I know that. Is it? It's a cover-up then? I think self-love is self-care. It's very important that you embrace the morning when you get up and you smile. You smile as much as you can. Why don't you smile with your eyes? There you go. You sparkle. You sparkle. It's a beautiful thing. Yes, and in Auschwitz, we were doing many things, silly things. We even had a boob contest. Can you imagine? I know you wrote about it. Us in that barrack. Yeah. yeah. Well, guess who won? I had a good body because I was a gymnast and I was a, I was um, studying ballet. And so I, uh, I tell you, we could think of a lot of jokes. And so we can keep ourselves somehow knowing that maybe this is temporary and we're going to survive. Hope, finding hope in hopelessness. So after rain, after the rain comes the rainbow. They know something that you also show to the children. The children don't do what you say. They do what they see. So be sure that you come home. Don't ask, how are you? Just give a hug to your wife and, and they will tell you, I'm so glad that you're home and that you treat each other with respect. Respect to me is the most important thing that you can practice. That makes sense. Edie, coming back to the story again, can you take us through, during the middle of your time at the concentration camp, can you take us through what a typical day would look like? You mentioned before eating soup and bread. I'd love to know more about when you ate, what you ate, what, what you do during the day? Four o'clock in the morning, standing outside, and they were counting heads. And they told you, if you're not feeling well, you can stay in the barracks, and they're going to take you to the hospital. But we found out that if you stayed behind, we'll never see you again. There was no hospital, there was the gas chamber. So you had to be very wise to study the territory. Have you seen a, a play called The Music Man? The first song is, you gotta know the territory. <laughs> you know, you have to, we had to study very quickly the territory and never ever stay behind because that was death. So that was very important to learn, four o'clock in the morning, and, and not knowing whether you're gonna end up in a gas chamber or not. So that's why every moment was very, very, very important to know that if I survive today, then tomorrow, hopefully, I will see my boyfriend who told me I have beautiful eyes and beautiful hands. That kept me going beautifully. And today, 
Unfortunately, I can tell you that he died. He was killed a day before liberation. So I never got to see him. I lost my whole family. But my sister is still alive. And she was 100 years old, January 13 this year. But if you ask her, she'll tell you she's 99 years old. I don't know why one year is going to make a big difference in a Hungarian woman's life. But she always lied about her age. Even when she came to America, I'm sure, when they ask her how old she is, she probably cut down that year. I, I'm thinking, I may going to request her birth certificate from the city where we were born, and I, they may have it. And I have a wonderful person here, Katie, and Katie, show your face. <laughs> Katie, Katie is doing everything here. Hi, Jesse. <laughs> Hi, Katie. She does everything. And uh, I know that maybe she can find out. Not that it matters anything at all. Uh, my sister even played bridge with Omar Sharif. She was a brilliant bridge bridge player i'd love to hear more about your sister i know you guys support each other during this this extremely difficult year what was that relationship like when you guys left the camp did it did you have a, a new level of bond and how did that progress over the years i i think there was a world of difference between us because she didn't believe in God. And I, I call my God, that God that was with me, within me. But she said, what kind of a God could allow anything like that to happen? She was not having any use for any God, as I do, because my God is my spirit, and and I think my God was guiding me from victimization to empowerment, that this is temporary. And if I survive today, tomorrow, I will be free, finding hope in home, hopelessness. So I did not talk to Magda much because I didn't want to argue with her. I never said, yes, but, yes, but, I do believe and you don't. I didn't go there at all. I just, I just found her where she was and thanked her for telling me and that's what I do today, too. Thank you for your opinion. Rather than, no, it isn't this way. I never deny someone else's truth. So if you tell me that green crocodiles walk on that wall, I say, oh, tell me about it. Meet people where they are and treat them as if they were what they are able to be. I remember I, I spoke at a Mexican school, and when I came in, one student was lying down, and the teacher told that boy to get up. For a child, yes means no, and no means yes, right? So I luckily found a pillow. So I go to the boy, and I put the pillow under his head, and I said, you might be a little more comfortable. He got up right away. <laughs> <laughs> so it is very important who you speak to and how you're going to 
develop a relationship of trust because that really was very important in Auschwitz. So when they took my blood at least twice a week or more, I asked, why are you taking my blood? I spoke German fluently. And he said, I'm taking your blood to aid the German soldiers so we can win the war and take over the world, at least America. So I, I didn't yank my arm away. But I said to myself, what a stupid idiot you are, that with my blood, see, I was a ballet student, with my blood you're going to win the war. So I had my own humor. It was not really very philosophical humor. It was sarcasm and cynicism, whatever it was, but I never allowed that person to get to my my spirit, my soul. Edie, I know we, we need to part ways soon, but before we do, I want to make sure we talk about your liberation from the camp. And the way I understand it from your book is you went from Poland, you were in the camp in Poland, and then you went to Germany, and then Austria, yeah. where you had your liberation. Yeah. So talk about talk about that period where you're traveling, and then what that moment was like when you were freed. Well, we were what is referred to now is the death march. And if you stopped, you were shot. And I revisited that place, every place I was. And I was about to shot when the girls that I shared the bread with, that Dr. Mengele gave me after that, they came and they carried me so I wouldn't die. And we arrived in a place called Gunskirchen. And I met a man who was one of the liberators. And his name is uh, um, uh, his name is Alan Moskin, M-O-S-K-I-N. You may want to reach him, a beautiful man. So when I arrived in Gunskirchen, cannibalism broke out. And when people were eating other people's flesh, see, I can't is not in my vocabulary. Because I asked, you know, what to do, and God told me, look down, and I had grass to eat. And even then I changed from one, I was picking one blade of grass over the other. And then pretty soon, I was among the dead. Someone was holding my hand. And I looked up, and I'm telling Oprah this, and I say to Oprah, I saw a big lip. And Oprah said, he was black. Yes. And then I looked up, and I saw tears in the eyes and M&M's in the hand. I wish I could meet this man today. And I was liberated then, May 4th, 1945. I uh, was not doing well. I was in a hospital. I could not breathe well. I, I still have a very bad scoliosis. And I was able to recover and get married and get pregnant. And the doctor said, I'm going to schedule an abortion because too weak to have a child. I said, sir, I want to give life. Good night. And my husband followed the doctor apologizing that his young wife doesn't know how to talk to a doctor with respect. Well, thank God, my little girl was like a 10-pounder. I could have had a horse doctor. So get a second opinion. This is what I tell you today. Get a second opinion. If I would have listened to my doctor, 
I wouldn't have my precious Marianne. I want to talk about that moment of liberation when that man reaches out, he he helps you off the ground, and he has M and M's for you. Talk about you. You mentioned you had to go to the hospital and and you you had the scoliosis, so physical things were happening. But talk about the feeling you had the moment you realized you were free. I had a lot of doubt. Uh, it certainly wasn't an overnight process. But in a hospital, I realized that my parents are not coming home. Because while I was there, I thought that somehow, if I survive today, then tomorrow, I'm going to meet my parents again. So reality hit me. I was told that my boyfriend was killed, and I became suicidal after I was liberated. And reality hit me. And again, the God that I talked to you about was guiding me to be for something rather than against anything, that I can now do good for others. And I, I'm Dr. Edith Eva Eager, <laughs> that I went back to school, thank God, and I uh, was able to also be part of the, uh, the military and doing a lot of work on post-traumatic stress. It's not a disorder, it's a, it's a, it's a grief over not what happened, but what didn't happen. Like I am grieving over the teenage years I never had. And I don't think we need to use denial or, or minimize it and suffering. I can guarantee you makes you stronger. I am a woman of strength, not a strong woman. I'm a woman of strength. And I know that we women, many times, believe in Romeo and Juliet. And when we marry someone, we marry someone who is the kind, loving, precious, romantic, and and nobody can live up to such expectation. So I think it's important not to have faulty expectations and to be a realist rather than an idealist. It's okay to dream, but don't mix up romanticism with realism. I get older and wiser, not old and senile, and every moment is precious. I live in a present. I can only touch you now. Well, Edie, you have so much wisdom to share what you do through your book and and through our conversation. And I really appreciate you sharing your story with such openness and vulnerability. And there's just so much great knowledge that you shared and, and inspiration. So I thank you so much. It's a true honor to speak with you. I feel wonderful being interviewed so brilliantly as you are and taking me back to a place where I got the best education, a place where I learned how to appreciate every moment. You're a brilliant interviewer. I want to thank you and hoping that people will sit down and look at their own lives and take in take a good inventory and not to say, why me? but to say, what now? Beautiful. Thank you. All right, Edie. Thank you. It's a real pleasure. I thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. And I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you.